All righty, folks, this is the session you are looking for. This is where the one and only millennial Mike goes through my comments. And I think on purpose, you guys let me know in the comments below. I think he tries to rile me up. I think he tries to get the blood pressure going. He brings on the hate. And I, I don't know what he's found because I never get him ahead of time. But I know there was a lot of hate this week. So I, I'm going to do my best to be measured. But uh, this might be a video you don't want to have in front of the kids. I, I have no idea where we're going to go. But when I get frustrated, my filter leaves me and the F-bombs might come. So fair warning. <laughs> well, yeah, Mike. So for everybody out there who doesn't know, the segment that you and I do together is where I go through the comments and I go through the Instagram messages and I pull out good questions. I pull out questions from beginners. I pull out questions about the economy, but I also like to pull out the angry comments, the spicy comments. And in honor of Dune 2 being in theaters, these comments are straight from Arrakis. I am bringing you guys premium spice. People are going to be pissed. Uh, or people are pissed in the comment yeah. section. But why don't we start with something that's not too angry? This one is about interest rates. Big surprise. This one came from a video that you were doing with Convoy Home Loans. This is from Terrence Scott, 781. He says, two weeks ago, it was lock your rate in and just refinance when the rates come down. Now it's lock your rate in before the rates go up. There's only one constant here, and that's to make sure you lock your rate in no matter what they do. LOL. That's very interesting. I'm curious as to when they would say maybe it's not a good time for most people to lock the rates in. So what do you think, Mike? You think the lenders are kind of like real estate agents in that it's always a good time to buy? You know, I think I, I remember that quote. I remember that comment. And I think there's a lot of truth in what the poster had to say. I, I would I would I would agree that most lenders, convoy, you know, um at the mortgage guy, Stephen Dow, I believe most of them would say if you like it, lock it. Uh I think we've had crazy interest rate moves over the last six months or so that maybe make that even more important. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that they talk their own book. I don't think that's unreasonable. Um, I will say, I, I don't know this. I'm not a lender, never been a lender, have no interest in being a lender. But I have to imagine one of the most unfortunate phone calls to make is to someone who didn't have a rate lock and you have to deliver bad news. I would guess delivering that bad news makes you hypersensitive to not want to deliver that bad news. So I, I think it makes I think it makes logical business sense. But to the second part of that question, like when would they ever say let it float, which is basically what they're asking. The only time that I could think about that is is heading into an interest rate meeting where it's really a coin flip, like the market doesn't know up or down. Because what what happens is mortgage rates get priced first. And and I don't know if people really realize that. We had we had more we had the Fed jack up the Fed funds rate like 11 months in a row or 11 meetings in a row, whatever it was. But mortgage rates always moved first. I think if we really had a coin toss and then it went down, it might make sense. But I I think in general, lenders probably don't like delivering bad news, hence lock. But I think it's a I think it's more than fair comment. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any anything spicy i think it, i think it makes logical sense i can understand the frustration from the commenter and the skepticism but you're right because most of the lenders at least the ones that i've spoken to when they talk about locking their rates they do always usually give the caveat that well if rates come down <laughs> they can usually price that in and you can get the lower rate still so yeah. it makes sense to lock it before it goes up in case it goes up all right mm -hmm. uh why don't we take a look at the next question which is this one's also another slightly positive question. <laughs> we I have a feeling something. I'm getting set up for something. Oh, yeah. I was going to get you happy before I just smack you in the face with some heat. Okay. All right. This one is about just getting started. It comes from Jay Cameo, 1800. He says that he really appreciates you, and he's late in life getting started with his real estate investing journey, and he's thinking about how hard – or thinking hard how he can purchase that first investment property. There's lots of challenges but just thinking about how to do it every day, reading one rental at a time at this moment, it's not just for him, but his children. So Mike, the question for you is how old is too old to get started investing in real estate? Um, so I actually have two answers for this. Uh, I'll give you the standard answer 
but then there's a little twist on it for this particular commenter. I generally believe if you think you're going to live five years or longer, it's okay to do the work, get a great deal. If you've been delivered bad health news, you have you know life expectancy less than five years, go do something else. You've heard me say a thousand times that the first five years suck. There's no reason, if you've been given a, a 24 month life expectancy, screw real estate, go enjoy life, go, go do whatever you want. So there's the first answer. The reason I wanted this commenter to have like a comma or a colon is what he said at the end, thinking about for my kids. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's your goal is to help them have something, I think that even goes to my second part. Like if you have two years left, getting something for your kids that will they will inherit when you leave, that's a great thing. So um, if you have a purpose greater than yourself, like the next generation, I don't think there is a bad time. But if you're single, widowed, no, you know, nothing else, you know, five years is minimal. That's that's what I think. Well, I can hear Dion ringing in the back of my head saying his favorite line, which is, you're going to be alive in five years. Start investing like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen to that. He's a wise one, that guy. <laughs> All righty. Let's bring a little heat. So this one comes from Brian Gione, 4949, and he says, agree. Financial independence is the key. By the way, your podcast is terrible. You'll never get 100,000 subscribers. Mike, what do you have to say? Um, That's a really weird comment. I don't know that I've ever been given a compliment or an agreement and then slammed in the next line. That's a, that's a new right. one for me. So congrats on being creative. Um, you know, comments like that don't bother me. I, I've, you know, the ones that really rile me up, I guess, are ones that, that they just don't get it. If you're just saying nasty things to be mean, dude, you can't say anything that hurts my feelings. I have heard so much crap in my life. I've been the little guy I've been in. Yeah. This stuff like that's just whatever. Um, uh, one thing I will say is it's, I think Gary V said this the first time. I, I I'm going to give Gary V credit. If it's somebody else, I apologize. But think about it for a minute. This individual took I don't know 60, 90 seconds out of their life to leave hate. What does that say about them? That's what I'm left thinking. Well, not only did they leave some hate, but we also have somebody who says you hate the poor. This one comes from Vila. C013 says, advocating for mortgage rates to be above 7% is ridiculous. Clearly, you aren't thinking about the low and middle class. So, Mike, why are you being so selfish for the rich? You know, when I when I put it out there, and last week and the week before, I let it be known that I want the housing market to slow down. And, and given the last six months, the only thing that's going to do that is mortgage rates over 7%. I knew with 100% certainty that there were going to be people that heard that and didn't understand. And if they just react emotionally, they're going to have opinions like that, which is 100% not true, not accurate, nothing further from the truth. In fact, my desire for 7% or higher mortgage rates is all about the poor. It is all about the middle class. Now, in the moment, it hurts. But again, I'm somebody who's trying to be around for the next 50 years. And I want the housing market to heal itself. And the only way to do that is to slow it down. And yes, if you happen to be shopping for a home at the moment, it hurts. But trust me. Let's play the other side. Let's say rates go down. More poor and middle class can buy. That means demand goes up. Supply goes up some, but not a lot. We then get bidding wars again. We then have buyers go on tilt and make bad financial decisions and over leverage. We then have a housing bubble that explodes in three to four to five years. And the poor and middle class are left decimated like 08. So at the end of the day, 
I believe 7% mortgage rates will slow down the housing market. I believe with every fiber of my body, it is a good thing. And I also understand that there's people that don't understand. And I will keep trying to make it clear. Um, but, you know, I can't fix stupid. And, you know, I'm not in the convincing business, but I believe it. And the last thing I'll talk about is this whole rich thing. If I cared about the rich, I would want rates to go down because rates going down means more demand, means prices go up. So that's just ass backwards. So this individual is um, out of touch, doesn't understand. It's not their fault. This stuff's not taught in school. You're watching a bunch of doomers and all of that stuff. It's okay. Uh, but trust me, I mean, the people that know me and watch the channel, they know that my core wants people on the property ladder. I believe getting on the property ladder is the path to generational wealth. And they know that I believe slowing the housing market down is important. So, you know, if this, you know, whatever. Yeah, I, I can't fix stupid. Hmm. I think this is just a great piece of evidence that highlights how your average person only pays attention to the headlines, only pays attention to the very surface level analysis that's given to grab their attention and monetize it. Everybody's been watching articles and videos where you see, oh yeah, a, a $500,000 house with a 3% payment, 3% interest rate versus a $500,000 house with a 7% interest rate. We're looking at a payment that's way higher. So all they think and all they process is high interest rate equals bad. But what they forget is that when interest rates were at 3%, we saw prices skyrocket. And so you think you're getting something good with those low rates. And a very few amount of people are the ones who already own assets who can quickly refinance. But most people are now going to be subject to the extreme competition that comes with cheaper money, which is why right now we're complaining about high payments. And two years ago, we were complaining about bidding wars where stuff was going for, say, it was going pending three hours after it was listed, $100,000 over what it was listed for. And everyone was pissed about that. So guess what? The market is tough no matter when you're trying to get into it. You have to do the work and find a good deal. Great deal. Great deal. And it's only great deals. And the last thing I'll say is, is if you are looking to buy, whether you're a homeowner or an investor, trust me when I say you want a slower housing market. Slower housing market increases your likelihood of finding a motivated seller. Motivated sellers give you a good price or terms or both. Uh, a hot housing market like we've had for two years, you know, it's speed and and price is the only thing you have. So, you know, yeah, that's what I think. All righty. So this one, you and I did a video last week reacting to Tom Bilyeu selling out and admitting on his channel flat out that, you know, hey, the only thing people click on is doom porn. So that's why I make it for you. Mm -hmm. uh, this one comes from Gua Gaucho or Gaucho Don. He says, tell us how you really feel, Mike, because you were being very level headed in that video. He says, tell us how you really feel, Mike. Kudos to you for usually taking the high road and shame on him for playing to that crowd. But isn't all business about giving people what they pay for, even only for their time? He 100% agrees on the misnamed channel being impact theory. But is he right? Is Tom Bilyeu just providing something to a market? Should you have gotten so angry that he's giving people what they want to click on? You know, that is a very adult comment and measured. And um, at some level, I agree with him. I overreacted. I, you know, I, I should, I should never count somebody else's money. If Tom has chosen to create a channel that's definitely leaning doom. It's got 4 million subs and he's doing it on purpose. He should be celebrated. I, I think this commenter is right. Um, if, if, if Tom's doing it on purpose and he's receiving the, the flowers, the money for doing what he's doing, I think this commenter is right. I had no right to get so pissed off. Uh, however, I think somebody worth $400 million who pulled themselves up by the bootstraps 
who did it the right way, meaning work, discipline, focus, gamble. You know, he had, he just, he did it. I guess it's my bias that they should be celebrating and trying to preach that. But you, but you're right. I have, I have no right to put that on Tom. If Tom doesn't want to do that, you're absolutely right. I was off. I was off base. So, um, but I stand by my comment. I could not believe somebody worth nearly half a billion dollars creates doom porn on purpose. It's just unconscionable to me, but, but you're right. I shouldn't count his money. If that's what he wants to do. And he's winning. Let's be clear. Impact theory. Tom Bilyeu is winning. So good for him. Um, Maybe I shouldn't have been so pissed off. Maybe, maybe I had, maybe I have higher standards for Tom than Tom has for himself. So shame on me. Yeah. I don't think shame on you in a, in a profession, for those who maybe don't watch me, I'm a police officer. Uh, we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. And I arrest a lot of people. A lot of people I've taken to jail. And the people that I hate to take to jail the most are people who work in the criminal justice system, police officers, attorneys, or even judges because you know better. You're making us all look bad when you do something so stupid that's put me in a position where now here comes the media, here come the news articles, here comes the social media, and now we all have to deal with your stupid mistake. So if we don't hold the people in our profession to a higher standard, uh, we're going to fail as a profession. So I don't think that it was wrong for you to say, Tom, you've got all this influence, you've got all this power. Do you really care that much about getting 25% more clicks on one of your videos because you're satisfying the market? Or is it better to actually put the truth out there? And the truth is the most counterculture idea there is nowadays. So I think it would be popular. Yeah. And again, I think Tom, I mean, our little four adventures platform, four guys came from nothing doing something. Tom is a hundred, a thousand X more impactful than all of us together. He he could change generations if he chose to kind of share that. And again, maybe that's not what he wants to do. I don't, I don't know. But yeah, I I just oh, I just wish he I just wish he wouldn't create doom porn. <laughs> All righty. Well, let's switch the topic and let's get a question from somebody about real estate specifically. This one's from Thierry Duthel or Duthel. Sorry if I said that wrong, my friend. He says, how long or how many units in one market or zip code before you should worry about diversification? Hmm. That was an interesting question. I remember that one as well. And the first thing that hit me was Dion, right? Dion uh, has his units. I forget what it is, 10 miles apart, whatever it is. And diversifies by um, payment type, right? Section eight, military, you know, private, uh, you know, cash payments, all of that. I, um, I honestly never thought about it. I mean, I own units, you know, like I own three or four houses on one street. I own, I'm a top ten landlord in a couple of zip codes in my market, maybe top fifteen now. Um, I don't. I never thought about it. I still don't think about it. Um, I've bought four houses in a row before. Um, I bought apartment buildings side by side before. Uh, I just buy the best deal. I don't, I, you know, frankly, I would rather own, like if there were four houses for sale, I would rather own all four than two of them because I want to control all of the quality. Right. Um, so I don't know. I've never really thought about it. I, I don't know that there is a number. Um, Dion will obviously disagree with me and that's okay. Uh, but to me, as long as you're buying in good areas with good tenants and, and all the other things work, I would I would gladly buy another house on any street I own if, if the numbers work. So I, I don't think about that. Yeah. Yeah. There's ways to diversify within your market. Um, but you know, realistically, one of the points that I make when people ask me why I continue to buy in Gary, Indiana, America's most miserable city. Of course, my joking comment would be the king doesn't diversify. Are you kidding? I just expand my kingdom. Why would I ever leave? Well, I would never betray the people. But in reality, when you spend the time to build the team and get the property manager in place and the contractors and you, you get the right team of people in place, it's a very daunting, difficult task to start that over somewhere new. So unless there's something really pushing me, why, why, why would I keep 
why, why would I create a new problem? Don't fix what's not broken. I mean, the hardest thing to do, and the reason I stayed in my market for 25 years is building a team. My God, that's hard. Yeah. I I, I don't want to do that again. So yeah, mm-hmm. you're you're great point. Yeah. The king doesn't diversify like that. <laughs> okay. We haven't had a comment from Jeff M in a while. Well, he does leave comments, but I haven't had a good question from Jeff M in a while. And he's talking about some of the same stuff that he used to talk about when it came to trying to buy a house, which he's just since bought a house. He owns a house now. Congrats, Jeff M. He says, Mike, I want to retire early and I look every day, all day in my market, but how do I get cash flowing assets? The math flat out does not work in my market. It's red hot and it's prolonging the 10 year timeline. I believe that 10 year timeline is his timeline to retire. Yeah. Um, this goes, this goes back to all the conversations, right? What, what I try to teach is the process the framework for figuring out your market, figuring out average, and then only doing great deals, right? We've talked about this a lot. But assuming you've done the work, which it sounds like Jeff M. has, there's a point in time where you've got to look yourself in the mirror and make some choices. A, do you want to stay in that market but switch asset types? This is something the Lumberjack did, right? He tried houses, then went small multis, now does bigger stuff. B, you could be like Dion. Right. What did Dion do? He got in his market. His market got hot. He went out another half hour and he found that property near the water. Uh, you could be you, where you tried in a high priced area, tried it for a lot, and then you went out of state. Uh, what did I do? I maybe just like Jeff M, I beat my head against the wall for a freaking year. It should have been six months, but I did it for a year because I was stubborn. And ultimately, I found a market two and a half hours away. I had no interest in living there. I never will live there but the numbers worked. So if you've done the work, you can articulate average and you've done the work for six months or more. Time to look yourself in the mirror and go, let's look for something else. Change asset or change location. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And obviously my answer to that, as you said, was to change the location. And I went really far away. You went two and a half hours away. I went 20 and a half hours away. It's actually further than that. But, uh, I went all the way to Indiana from Seattle and I built an entire YouTube channel and brand about investing at a distance, long distance real estate. You can do it. Most people are concerned about how they would do that at a distance. How do I find the right team? How do I find the right properties? How do I not get taken advantage of? Those are all completely valid concerns. The most important thing is boots on the ground. You need to find people you can trust. And I teach people how to find them. So if you're interested in a longer conversation about that, follow me on my channel. All right, Mike, I know you thought we were out of the woods, but there's a little bit more heat coming your way. So this one, this one, a little more heat from the viewers. This one comes from Sean Madden, 75. He says, claims, I'm an ex-hedge fund manager and family office senior investor. I made a killing in distressed RMBs in Florida real estate post 2008. This discussion, your discussion, missed so many points and I don't know where to begin. Case in point was dismissing transaction volume at 25 year lows. I turned it off after that. Good day. So have a good day, Mike. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, I don't know what he's pissed off about. I called a transaction crash. In fact, I was the first person and I got receipts uh, calling for the 40 or 50% drop. So um, I don't know what, I don't know why he's upset. I was right. So unless you're upset because I was right, I don't, I don't know what you're, I you know I I don't know what to do with that comment. He's he's mad because I was right. I I don't get it. I honestly thought that maybe it was an example of people who are just so reactionary that before they even watch a video, they hear one thing, click pause, leave a comment, and leave. Because it felt to me like he must not watch your channel. Like he's trying yes. to make a point that you've already made, and I, I don't know if he just heard something. It was like, oh, this guy's an idiot. Transactions are an all time low. I'm out. Like, yeah, th- that's the point. Yeah, it's just Mando. By the way, I called it early, called it right, and uh, yeah, I don't, I, I, I you know, I don't know. I'm sure to do with that comment. <laughs> okay, all righty. Uh, so this one's uh, our last question for the day. This is for Mike, the economist, the college-educated economist. Comes from Chris Webb, forty-seven ninety-seven. He says, "Yes, the metrics we use to measure the economy are out of whack right now. GDP is up." 
Job numbers are good, but talk with anybody who's working class and they have different ideas about the economy doing well. I've heard that gross output is a better measure of how the economy is doing. I have not had the time to review it, but I may have to find the time because the metrics being used now are not creating an accurate picture. And I think this is really a question at what we continue to see the news say, which is everything's good, unemployment's down, there's no recession, the numbers look great, but people on the ground working every day can feel it's more expensive, can feel how things are slowing down, can feel how bad it is. So do you think, Mike, we need to change how we measure the health of the economy to get a more accurate reflection? I think, you know, I think you can always have more, more data, right? I, I do. I think the idea of gross output is intriguing. Um, you know, we are a service-based economy versus manufacturing. So that'll be interesting. I haven't looked at the data, so I don't, I don't know what it says, but stepping back from the bigger picture, I think we're, I think what's really going on in the economy is we are, we have indigestion. The government basically printed $10 trillion in a very small window, shoved it into the economy. It's like, it's like overeating and we have indigestion. Now, how do you how does that get fixed? Time, time helps that. Losses. What is in what does indigestion look like in my opinion? Well, it's all the it's all the syndications that were general partners doing value add with short term debt losses. Uh, all the office buildings being sold for pennies losses. Right. Part of indigestion is we're going to have losses. Uh, we're going to have bankruptcies. I think there's a lot of doomers pointing at bankruptcies as a problem. And I'm like, no, bankruptcies are good, right? Bankruptcies doesn't mean the business stops. There's all kinds of bankruptcies. Bankruptcies means we can deal with the debt and rejigger the debt. So maybe the company can keep going. Now, some of them go to zero and that's okay. We have misallocation of capital. We have misallocation of resources. All of this happens when an economy, again, this was a great experiment. Right. There's there's always been this idea that you could rain money down from helicopters and, you know, everything would be OK. And it's not. It's not. You you misallocate. It's it's a misallocation of capital, meaning money and a misallocation of people, meaning hours and, and, and work. And the economy is still working through it and, and we're seeing it. And um, yeah, it's. We're, we've seen M2 money supply decline by significant amounts, like the first time since the Great Depression. But if you zoom out, we're still way above trend. And that's because we have indigestion. We, we've got to get that number down to trend. And um, there's a lot of losses and pain coming. So, yeah, I, I think I, I think he's right. I, I think there could be other measures of the economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it does feel somewhat like the population just gets continually either gaslit or <laughs> this is a reference well, you would get. Well, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, I was I, gonna I say, was, go ahead. You first. I was going to say the reference you won't get is they're just looking at you and saying there is no war in bossing say, uh, which just means that what you, what you're feeling and experiencing isn't right. The economy is perfectly fine. Don't pay attention to the fact that that box of cereal that was $3 two years ago is now $6 and, and smaller it's half and, a, yeah half the size and, smaller. Exactly. and people are tired yeah. of it no i i get it i mean i it, inflation hurts everyone i've seen crazy right i mean i have a lot of insurance right uh i have a i have my dream car so when my dream car insurance nearly doubles and it's older shocks me um when when i get cancellations because i'm in california and my insurance quote goes up 80 percent shocking and, um, you know, I feel it all the time, but it's, uh, the other thing I I'm left to think about is I think what we may be hearing is the noisy few making all the noise. Cause I think the people that are down and doing the work and, you know, moving forward and buying assets and just doing the work, we don't have time to come out and talk, but you've, you got these little, you know, nobody's in their mom's basement putting out crap and it, maybe it's just a noisy few. I don't know. I mean, unemployment's been below 4% for what, two years now. Mm -hmm. 
that that's that's not normal right i when i went to school i mean people may not believe this but i was trained as an economist that full employment was 6% 6% was the goal First, we're at three seven or three eight or whatever it is. It's crazy. Yeah, I remember when I was in high school, which has been a while for me now. It was five percent is what we were taught was good. You needed five percent unemployment because that allowed movement within the economy. Yeah, yeah. So, well, Mike, those were all the questions that I had for you this week when I pulled from the. I comments. get it. I keep my call. You didn't lose it. Yeah. So what I would suggest to people out there, hey, if you want a question or an idea or a common answer, you can send it to me in an Instagram DM at Millennial Mike. I'll make sure that it gets featured here. If you have a video you want Mike to react to, send it to me. I'll either clip it down or if it's a short, we'll watch it and react to it. Uh, but this is your opportunity to get your direct question sent to me and answered. And again, folks, he does not tell me the questions ahead of time. So send them privately if you'd like. Leave them below. He does. Uh, he does go through them. Uh, and man, I, I appreciate you more than, you know, Mike, thank you very much. Of course.